What's up, everybody? It's Ivan with Trout's Fly Fishing, joined by uh, Russ Miller. Russ, how are you today? Hello, world. Hello, I'm great. great. How are you? How are you? Here, Russ, let's have you scoot over to your... Uh... Yep, perfect. There you go. There you go. All right, uh, so we're doing five flies a little bit different this month, uh, doing it live, having uh, Russ join us. We're going to talk about all the good fishing that can be had uh, here in the month of April. Um, you know, blue wings obviously are playing a larger and larger role, which is something that I enjoyed a lot. And then also majors are still present, but then we're going to start to see caddis and stoneflies and streamers. And you know, there's a lot of uh, dynamic stuff happening this time of year, isn't there, Russ? It's, it's a, a super, super exciting, exciting time to be an angler, uh, whether, whether you're, you're held up held on the front range or you're in one of the Rocky Mountain destinations. Um, it's all starting to come alive and we can see that and I'm thinking about mowing my grass, which means that things are really coming alive. Right, right. That's, <laughs> that's a big thing right there. For sure. Totally. No, it's an exciting time. Um, uh, April's kind of one of those magic months. Uh, I've heard it referred to as the fifth season quite a bit. Um, meaning it's kind of one of the big ones to celebrate. Um, pre-runoff as things are really heating up from an angling perspective. For sure. So we're going to do this, obviously we're doing this a little bit different than we normally would. Uh, you know, we are going to be looking at comments. If you guys have any questions about the flies, I know Russ is going to talk a little bit about rigging here shortly. Um, so, you know, feel free to sound off in the comments. Let us know if you have any questions about, uh, you know, fishing this time of year, but also, uh, you know, the specific flies that we'll talk about as well. Uh, this edition, we're going to sort of focus on uh, what I, I like to consider a sort of a godfather of uh, modern flies in many ways. Uh, old John Barr. There he is, the, the I, legend. I wish he could join us For because sure. that guy can tell a story. Yeah. Um, and I'll do my best to kind of get in character. Although I should have like a, a Hawaiian shirt on with like birds of paradise on it or something like that. For sure. Um, For sure. If any of you guys go down and see trouts at the Denver Fly Fishing Show in January, John Barr usually is floating around one of the three days, and you can easily ID him in the crowd because no one has as flamboyant a shirt on as John Barr does. <laughs> he's a legend. He's a legend for a lot of reasons, but uh, flamboyant <laughs> shirt is certainly another, just another, you know, like icing on the cake for sure. Uh huh. Uh huh. So he, he's a beyond amateur birder, yeah. um, beyond average fly tire. And uh, beyond average angler, too. Nice. Well, th these are all good things uh, to yeah. have in a fly tire, for sure. So, so go ahead, yeah. Russ. You wanted to talk, you know, obviously, John's the the father of uh, the Copper John. We all Copper John is the fly that you guys probably recognize most. Um, uh, one of the other things that I'm going to do here is, um, is I'm going to pull out and we're going to do a little coaching session. Um, uh, a little education. This is very John Barr in its essence. Uh, John loves to obviously design flies, but he design this, designs them in a system to work together. So I'm going to talk about some of John's systems that he likes to fish um, and in hopes that it gives you some success out on the water uh, and allows you to, you've probably heard of some of these systems, um, but we're going to dive into them a little bit deeper uh, and I'm going to kind of expand upon them and Put a little bit of my own personal twist in there, and uh, I apologize, John, if you're tuning in. I doubt it, unfortunately. Uh, he's not a tech man. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we're going to do a little whiteboard session. Cool. Since we're not on the river, I'm in my basement. Uh, this is what it looks like to, to work at Umqua at the moment. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to bust out the whiteboard. We're going to run through some stuff. Cool. Um, hit Yvonne with the comments. He's going to shout them out at me if you guys have questions. Uh, and I will do my best to answer all of your questions. Um, but let's do a little quick learning before we jump into the flies. For sure. Let's do it. All right, coach. Here we go. The basics, right? And I think any good coach would tell you that it all starts with the basics. Um, so we're going to start here with the basics. I've got a looped leader. Um, all of my leader connections are probably going to end up being, uh, you guys see this all right? What if I did this? 
a little bit better maybe. All my loop connections here uh, at the end of my leader are likely going to be a, um, a surgeon's knot or a blood knot, depending on diameter. And I'm going to attach uh, some tippet. And here on fly number one, we're going to do some kind of, uh, of, of hopper uh, pattern here. The chubby's kind of taking the place of that one. Um, Umqua and John Barr, they, there's the BC, the Bar Craven hopper. Um, and that one is a really great floater, but down below there, what we're typically going to do is tie on, um, another piece of tippet right off the bend of the hook with a simple clinch knot here to our next fly. And I drew a, uh, stylized version of the copper John and off the bend of that hook, we'll usually do one more little piece here. Uh, um, calls this whole system he calls that the hopper copper dropper right and so one of the things he thought about when designing a system like this is how to get anglers down into the fish's zone a lot earlier um we've gotten much more advanced in this over the years but you know john's been doing this since the early 70s um and you have to go back in time in your mind um Flies didn't come with bead heads for a long time. So like Uncle introduced the first gold gold beaded fly. That was the first color of bead that came out was gold. Um, and, uh, and John thought about this system here and he was like, how do we get down to the fish better? These really small imitative flies, but you know, let me get a fly that can get down in there. So he came out of this hopper copper dropper setup. Um, this is how you would rig everything. We call this in line. So right, you're tying everything to the back of the hook. Uh, so that um, it's all in one consistent line. So if a fish eats the smallest fly, it's got to move this one, and then it's got to move this one. Um, one of the ways I love to rig this, we'll use our exact same fly setup here. Um, some guys are going to recognize this uh, from maybe the nymphing world, um, but it works really great fishing out of the boat or waiting. And we're going to come down here, and here I'm going to drop a tag in. So here is going to be a, a triple surgeon's knot with my tag long, and I'm going to fish my same awesome copper john. And up here, I'm going to fish my smaller, maybe bar merger uh, up at the top, right? And the logic being here when you're fishing it, can you guys see this all right? But I've got a dropper rig, um, a dropper that comes off here down to my heavier copper john. And uh, the Copper John, what that's going to do is keep everything anchored and tight in line, right? So it's down here. This is almost kind of like a drop, a drop shot rig, if anyone's familiar with that kind of rig. Um, so heavy fly on the bottom, and then off of a tag right here, I've got my small imitative bug. And if you look at how things get caught up in the drift when you're actually fishing, um, the heavier stuff falls out first, right? Uh, or, or, or won't fall out, and it's going to be a lot closer to the bottom of the river and the substrate. And then up in the wash a lot more, you're going to find more of those imitated mayflies. So uh, as far as how I like to fish, if fish are, are active within the water column, um, this is a really great way to do it. And it's an incredibly sensitive rig without having to, to trade out uh, flies. The other advantage of a rig like this is we're seeing more and more factory barbless flies coming onto the marketplace and the uh, uptick in popularity of those. Um, you're able to fish these barbless flies without your dropper kind of rolling off the looped end. So this is a really awesome way um, to rig uh, that 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 kind of the evolution of the hopper copper dropper. Um, um, and that's really and John that's really Barr's John Barr's kind of, kind of I call I call it a signature rig. Um, right in, in this day and age where we're at with what we do for angling, we're so used to fishing dry dropper, especially out of the boat and. Here in we're Colorado, so we're to so used on. to tacking on that second dropper um, to really fish dry drop drop. But uh, credit where credit's due, John Barr was really the pioneer of this idea. And the way he designed, the way a, lot he designed a lot of his flies was exactly for this kind of fishing right here That's uh, that I've tried to outline on the whiteboard. Hopefully you Did. guys can see it. Yvonne, any questions, Yvonne, any over, questions there? over there? So, <clears throat> one question from Jaron. Um, how far apart are you putting each fly? You know, that really depends on the distance you're fishing uh, or the depth you're fishing, um, the distance. So if you're going to be waiting, um, and right now we're seeing a lot of fish moving up into those shallower riffles, uh, kind of out of that deep slow water, 
you know, kind of that one and a half times the depth um, as a general rule, right? You don't want to essentially, you don't want to have nine feet in between there. Um, but you want to, you want to head. Um, I re-rig constantly. So there's a lot of re-rigging happening based on the changes um, uh, of the water type I'm going to be fishing. So it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a moving, moving target, target, but, but um, that one, one and a half times is a good general rule for jumping, for jumping off. off. Yeah. Uh, Austin and Craig also ch ch chimed in. Does uh, this approach with that long tag, uh, does the rig tend to get tangled? No, no. Uh, one, one of the advantages is, is it'll, it'll wrap, wrap, right? right? Um, um, and you, and see, you see this all the time with soft tackle, tackle right? right? Uh, uh, you pull a soft tackle out of the water and it's just completely flat. And it doesn't look sexy at all. And then the minute you drop it in the water, it does this and opens up and parachutes and becomes this beautiful soft tackle again. It's the same thing with that tag. So my tags are typically five, six inches. Uh, personally. You don't get as many fly changes out of it, but you do get less wrapping. So what'll happen is that small fly will wrap around um, and you'll, you'll be like, oh my gosh, this is driving me nuts. And you'll pull it apart fishing. Um, if you were to just leave it and drop it in the water, you'll see that thing naturally float away from that, uh, that leader. And so don't worry about it. Don't freak out about it. This rig, uh, one of the other reasons I love it is it does tend to get tangled less when we're casting, right? Um, because you've got your heavy fly at the bottom, right? So it helps with accuracy and delivery, having that weight extend out um, and, and, uh, and kind of like lengthen out your entire rig um, versus having that really light one at the very back, which can dangle around and find that heavier fly a lot easy. So it actually tangles in general a whole lot less overall. Cool. Uh, somewhat unrelated, and perhaps we'll save this for the end of this, but... Uh... So I'll move on to a different question, but um, do you prefer hopper as your indicator or traditional thingamabobber, especially for technical water like the South Platte? Where do you, where do you stand on that, Russ? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it comes, tell you, it comes down, down to, down to, time, to time, year. time of year. Um, um, I, I, it's crazy when we hit those warmer months and you're hiking into the canyon um, in particular, and you're literally hearing like, and you're hearing hoppers everywhere. I see so many guys still fishing indicators. Um, I think it um, would blow people's, people's mind how often, how often those, those technical, technical fish, fish become, become really, really ignorant. ignorant. Um, um, and, fishing and fishing this exact, this exact method, method, method in the canyon can be devastating. Be devastating. You'll, get, you'll, get you'll get surprisingly, surprisingly far more dry more than, than you would imagine. Um, which, um, is a which is a blast. For sure. For sure. I, I, know, I, know, I know people don't... People get scared of necessarily of fishing some bigger patterns on the South Platte and... You'd be surprised yeah, yeah. what fish in there will eat um, year round. Not so. not like uh, uh, like February, they'll they'll crush crane flies. Huge fly, huge huge crane flies. So yeah, 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 yeah like a moth, yeah, like a moth, right, right, like a moth. <laughs> um, no, no, I should say, like, 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 John Bar, John Bar, great crane fly. It was actually it was developed, actually on, developed the on the South Platte. Nice. Uh, 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 so we're gonna we have a couple other questions. Uh, one and a half times the depth. From Hopper to the next fly from David? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, would I would say if you're fishing, if you're fishing this, this like weight fishing around the boat, the boat, right? Um, um, you know, I, you know, I, I live here in Gold and I fish and Clear Creek quite, quite a bit. Um, um, you can have you everything, can have everything from, uh, from a, a holding pool that's going to be, you know, waist to chest deep um, to, you know, water that those fish hold in in those tail outs that are, you know, a foot. Um, Speed plays a role. Uh, I like to try to set a rig that I can continually move with uh, as much as I can versus having to dial it in for each spot. I tend to find places in the canyon I really will re rebuild a rig for the spot I'm about to fish because sometimes those fish don't give it up as often or they tend to be in groups, right, where you find one in one water type, you're going to find more. And so I'll try to, to dial in a rig specifically for that. But, um, you know, Again, this time of year, what's so magical about April uh, and the flies we're going to be talking about here is that these fish have moved out. Like in the winter months, they occupy essentially like 3% of the entire river uh, in that wintering water. As those water temperatures come up, these fish are moving into all of that other water. So we don't have to sit there and fish, you know, that stuff that's 10 feet deep. We can start to fish much, much shallower. And this holds true as you start moving into those warmer summer months and 
um, maybe maybe do your first float of the year. So Tyler's asking, how often would you re-rig on a float trip? Would you constantly be changing your rig because of changing depths? Uh, yeah, uh, Tyler, that's a really good question. I actually, my first change will be a weight change versus a depth change, um, right? I, it's going to be pretty easy for me to just change out one fly. So like this bottom one here, um, I will, you know, have a heavier version, sometimes a larger version to help plummet it. Um, and some of those deep kind of froggy waters, uh, or that really fast edge water where you know that they're, you know, this far from the edge or, or they're not playing. Um, again, this rig, this, this helps you be accurate in exactly that scenario where you're trying to be right against the bank with that dropper, um, and make a good mend. So you're landing dry fly dropper in line. Uh, and then that little, you know, quite a. I'll make a, a weight change before I make a depth change, um, uh, typically, right? Especially for floating because it's fast. Um, fly back in. Sure. Because you got to be hydrating and changing flies. All I mean, it's like there's a lot to lot to take in. Do you tend to bring just one rod? Yeah, uh, the two rods is always so much better. Uh, I think we talked about, I did a live video with you guys a little bit ago, uh, talking about um, my preferences when it comes to like a micro leader for, for very effective nymphing. Um, it doesn't do dry dropper very well. So, so in that scenario, definitely having a second rod is a huge advantage for an angler. Um, and also this time of year, you know, Josh, one of your guys, um, I've been following along some of his stories and like the blue wing activity at Deckers right now is staggering. Like a rod that fishes a single dry fly very well uh, looks like that would be your best friend. She doesn't look like my audio is going through. It's unrelated, but it's an upgraded question. So uh, is there a way to buy the backpack part of the Umqua Zero Sweep Overlook chest pack the older model. Oh, um, boy, that's a long shot. If there was an opportunity to do so, it would be a one-off. I'm sure the guys at Trouts could get a hold of uh, the dealer services department of Umqua and answer that for you. I don't know how to answer that effectively. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll give it a shot. We'll, we'll see. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so there's a bit of an audio issue. I just want to wait for people in the comments to tell me if it sounds terrible. Go ahead and talk for me, Russ. Testing, testing. One, now, two, three. Flies. I'll talk to. All right. Now, now in now in the comments, tell us how bad that sounds. We're gonna get that sorted out before we go into the flies. I don't know. It doesn't seem like. It. So, uh, any other stuff you wanted to talk about rigging, or did you want to start talking about flies, Russ? I think let's jump into the flies because there's a lot of fun conversations to be had there. Sounds good. Cool. All right. Um, let's see. We're going to go fancy this. We're trying fancy live streams this time, guys. So uh, let's see. Let's do it. What? Fly number one. <laughs> All right, there, there was fly number one. Let's see how that went over. Uh, John Bars, Copper John, size 12, in blue. A less traditional color, but uh, a productive color nonetheless. I don't have blue in my box, um, and that's simply because the guys at Trouts have them all. Uh, disc. Um, well stocked. The Copper John is... Uh, is truly one of the angler staples. Um, to not talk about the Copper John is to not talk about um, kind of a link in our legacy between really traditional flies and uh, a lot of the modern nymphs that we see today. Um, you know, John, uh, as I said, kind of back in the back in the the mid seventies, 
Um, one of his favorite flies uh, was the brassy. Um, the brassy, kind of in its day again before bead heads, all of that that wire um, enabled the fly to really access depths that you you couldn't break into easily, especially with small flies. Um, so if John was kind of playing with uh, with the copper John. Um, you know, he was using that for segmentation and was just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's pack this stuff in there and create a fly that's really going to help drown some of my other flies. Um, and that was his, his true logic behind a lot of the Copper John was to, to help drown some smaller stuff. And, and that's why I wanted to show those rigs earlier was that John is thinking about systems and how it all incorporates together and not just one particular fly. Although the Copper John, as I said, is a true standout um, and a testament to that, I don't know, man, it'd be fun to hear comments about about who, how many of you guys have Copper Johns in their boxes. I mean, I've got in so many different boxes of mine personally. Um, it's uh, it's it's pretty cool. I would hope it's everyone. Uh, that'd be my hope. And the, the blue in particular is kind of one of those colors that, that may or may not be in your box yet. I guarantee you have the copper one somewhere. Maybe you've done the zebra um, or the red one was really kind of had its moment. But, but blue is one of those colors. My first experience with blue, when I first saw it, I was like, this is a, this is a joke. Um, come on now. And then you take it down to a river like, you know, the pan or the plat and – you start devastating fish. You're like, well, there's clearly something to this blue thing. Um, and the and same, same holds true with, with, with Copper, Copper Johns. Johns. I mean, I, mean, I know, know you've, you've got, got some thoughts. thoughts on blue. Yeah, so, and it's something I, I remember picking up from Kirk Dieter. Uh, I think he wrote a piece about it a couple years ago. And basically, we as anglers look at colors and see them as they would be in the, you know, in our box or, you know, at, in the fly shop. We don't necessarily think about what they're doing subsurface and blue, the way blue, the UV spectrum works, and I'm not sciencey enough to know, but basically blue, you can still remains blue and true blue, like at depth. And so if, and it always, it's also an attractant, like a color that sort of fish will tune into. It's not necessarily always gonna work, but when you fish blue deep, uh, you know, when fish aren't necessarily feeding in the, the riffles, they might be holding a little bit deeper, like earlier in the morning, Blue can be a really productive color because you're not, uh, you're not sort of everything sort of gets gray. Like I know reds get gray, I think pinks sort of get gray down deep, and so the blue can sort of stand out and be a good, like almost hot spot, uh, if you will. So absolutely, and, and I think as we as we come to fly number two, which I'm not going to jump the gun on, it becomes really important, kind of having that attractor to the rig. Um, you know, I, I, I've, watched, uh, I've watched it a couple times. Someone's got a, um, a color spectrum. It's a conventional gear site. Maybe you can find the link and post, post it in, in the comments. comments but yeah. they have the full spectrum of colors, and they drown it at all the different levels, and they show you the depth as it's going down. And you can watch those colors change. And, like, blue and chartreuse, you're just like, I'd fish a lot more of those if I'm fishing. Right, for sure. Um, so we have a, a couple questions. Um, cool. Opinions on the Copper John versus the – Rubber leg copper john. Hmm. Uh, time and a place, right? Um, rubber leg copper johns, kind of that 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 bigger, buggier profile oh, for sure. those times when you're seeing those those leggier flies really kicking around. Um, it's great out of the boat because those rubber legs will kick around um, and just give you a little bit more action, especially. You know, I love in the summer floating months when we're able to fish that riprap. Especially, I'm, I'm picturing the Colorado River. I'm picturing a high bank of riprap, um, and it's bang, 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 fish the pocket, fish the pocket. Um, those rubber legs just kick off a lot of extra, um, a lot of extra movement. The other thing that's super cool, and I've got a few of them here, um, is uh, we are now doing a jig version of the Copper John for, for folks, folks that really, really like, like um, fishing that that jig fly and the benefits of of kind of where the hook gets placed in the fish's mouth um, so yeah, yeah the copper john is coming in a lot of different variations uh um because it's one of those flies you gotta have and and there's a time and a place for each one of those variations sure um question on copper versus blue i think 
from my perspective, uh, both time and a place, like we were saying, I think, you know, copper, copper, red, like there's certain, certain rivers, red. I just all always fish that with confidence. I think confidence also plays a, a bit of a role there as well, but, um, you know, copper versus blue, I think both are good options. You know, while we did choose co- uh, blue as the, uh, representative for the copper drown this month, certainly you can fish, uh, copper, blue, zebra, you know, take your pick chartreuse. Um, you know, they all, and especially in a variety of sizes, they can represent a variety of bucks. So you take that blue out to one of our free stones is starting to wake up. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's our name, it's our name river or state name river. Uh, I guarantee you those fish are going to come right over to that rig and inspect what's happening. For sure. All right. Uh, there we go. We're going to talk about fly number two, which is not, not yet. Fireworks. Um, oh, my audio is gone. Uh, fly number two, bars, bead head emerger, size 16, blue wing olive. You can also do size 18 as well. Uh, this is probably, I mean, I, I like the copper drown, uh, but in terms of uh, flies that I will have in my box year round, but especially this time of year, bead head emerger sort of leads the back. So this is that fly I was talking about, John Barr wanting to drown. Um, and I don't know how you, how well you can see it. I've got a couple beaded versions in here. I've got a couple non-beaded as well as BW and PMD. This literally is the John Barr hopper, copper, dropper box. Um, uh, it's one of, the, one of the boxes that you could take out on the water and catch fish 365 days a year on. Um, the bar emerger has, uh, it's kind of like the Copper John. It's got its own kind of momentum and legacy about it. Um, the other thing about the bar emerger is just like the Copper John, it comes in a ton of different variations, right? Um, we've got it in a beadhead version, which is an excellent choice for this time of year. Whether you're going to be fishing um, down in the South Platte and you want to have something that has a little bit of weight to it so you can run uh, a tandem pair. Of flies, um, it'll help get get down to the bottom a little bit better. Or you're going to be fishing it, um, you know, underneath the Copper John. Uh, it's it, it it helps keep that rig down where you want it to be. Um, again, rigging this system a little heavier tippet to your first fly. That second fly becomes that really light, delicate tippet. Um, that way, you're getting the best presentation out of that fly possible. You go with too heavy a tippet. You reduce your cut rate through the water, which helps it fall. Uh, it also helps it move. Um, the other thing is, right, it happens quite a bit, especially pre-runoff right now, uh, is we find a lot of debris, woody debris on the bottom in particular. Uh, it's hard to get flies back out of that woody debris. And rather than breaking off two or three flies, you lose one. Um, so uh, rigging that appropriately, John would love me to talk about that. Um but, uh, but yeah, that bar merger, man, there is, there's a lot of sex to it. And I think the sexiness of that fly is in its simplicity. Um, it's not over the top. It's fairly dull and um, impressionistic, um, understated, and, and really powerful as far as finding fish. I, I think any of your free stones is going to work well. But, I mean, oh, yeah. South Platte, you know, it'll, it'll work well. Any – river that has trout i'm confident with the, the beadhead emerger well any of them i mean any of his emergers but you know the beadhead i like you know getting a little having a little bit of extra weight uh this time of year but you know by all, all means if uh the beadhead doesn't float your boat you can just go sh- with the straight emerger and you'll uh you know say put that behind uh sparkle done or you know extended body blue wing or something like that and you know trail that Emerger behind there, and you'll uh, get into fish. Those fish that are sort of rising in those pods and stuff like that. So, one of the new flies you'll find uh, down at Trout's too. Um, you guys may be out of them. They've been a hot seller. Uh, we've got a new version of the. It's called the Dark Back, 
And so that wing case is, is black, just like that, that, that emerger that's about to bud um, as it's coming up to the surface. And that's a, an, another one of these variations of the, the bars emerger that, you know, it's just a slight tweak, but there are those times and places where that dark back, it's, it's kind of like a crack back PMD when, when they are keyed into that, that, that pad um, game over, it's really your advantage as an angler. For sure. All right, we're going to move on to fly number three. I had Yvonne switch some stuff for flow, and I think it's... Fly number three is uh, the tungstone... It's actually a little bit smaller than you'd normally fish in a, uh, you know, in a uh, stonefly, but it's size 18, sort of a micro stone, uh, can catch uh, some fish's attention this time of year. So certainly good throughout the size range. I think it's what from like a 12 down to an 18, or like a 10 down to an 18, or something like that. Uh, but we we figured we'd throw in a, a smaller version, uh, sort of uh, think a little bit outside the box when it comes to the the old tungstone. Absolutely, and that, that's where those, uh, those free stones that are, are waking up now, those fish are used to seeing. Have you guys ever hopefully been out on the Colorado and you've seen those winter stone flies showing up? Um, they are a true 18. Um, it's kind of here in Colorado, it's the first stone fly that we get to see, that trout get to see. Um, so even if there are some larger um, bugs underneath the rocks that you're seeing, um, they're used to seeing that. There's a comfort level when it comes to eating that size. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's another one of John's just awesome impressionistic flies that, that, be, that becomes very realistic in its look and presentation, um, but also very impressionistic that it can work uh, across the size range for a total variety of different stone flies. But the size 18 this year is a real killer on those free stones, without a doubt. For sure. I actually saw some small stones this weekend uh, on the South Platte. So cool. those, those, things are, those things are around um, and a good option. You know, uh, you don't find a lot of small stone flies. Like Pats isn't coming in a size 18, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's, it's a great, great one to have. It, you know, it doesn't come in the 18. So the tungsten, uh, definitely a worthy addition to the box. Tungsten as well. Tungsten as well, well and, and, and uh, again, fishing that, that two-fly rig. I'm a big fan of reducing the amount of weight that we put actually onto our leader um, because when a fish has to eat um, and it pulls this fly, that weight has to, to move as well before it registers up at your indicator um, or whatever you're using, whether it be a bobber, a piece of nylon, or, um, uh, or a dry fly. But it has to move that weight, and so anytime we can build the weight into the fly – um, you end up with a little bit more sensitive rig overall. Uh, and again, that, that's what makes this fly winner paired with the bar emerger. We just did, um, or paired, paired with some other fly. flies. Shall we do it? Shall we go to, uh, fly number four? All right. Let's see if I can do it again. It's the best lead and I can do. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Fly number four, the tongue teaser. This is size 16. Russ, talk to us about the tongue teaser. Tongue teaser. Uh, I can clearly remember my first day fishing this fly. Um, I, was, I was clean shaven. There was no gray, uh, no kids that I could almost audibly hear outside in the backyard. Um, uh, we were down on the lower blue. Um, uh, fish in a friend's water and uh, he, he, he said hey I don't know if you've tried this but you know they like it pretty good down in here and I was like oh, okay yeah 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 cool it kind of looks you know princey um, I put it on and proceeded to just have a perma smile for the rest of the day um, the tongue teaser since then has kind of been uh, in my box uh, I pull it out on a, a fairly often uh, especially as we start to, uh, this time of year, as we start to warm up. Um, it really is a kind of a reverse Prince. Uh, John took apart the Prince nymph, the elements of what make a Prince nymph really work. Um, 
barred it up a little bit, and uh, and and here we have the tongue teaser. Um, I later found out uh, again from a friend, different friend this time. I, I retold that story about being down on the lower blue, and uh, and he told me, "Oh, well, that's that's where John developed that fly. I don't know if you knew that." Um, and uh, and that made me smile again. Um, I was like, "Well, that would maybe explain why it works so dang well." Um, but, uh, but yeah, but yeah that's, uh, it uses the, instead of the, the white wing case, like you see on a Prince nymph, um, which is super traditional, John takes that and moves those, um, uh, those fibers onto the, the rear of the fly for the tail. And so you kind of get that little trigger, uh, at the very rear of the, the tail. And then it's just got this unbelievably buggy look. Um, well, I've been at home, uh, a, more than I'm used to, um, I've been thinking about a lot of angling adventures and uh, some of the the awesome things that we've got kind of uh, in front of us. Um, the the drakes are one of those. Uh, it's one of those flies. Once you see big fish eating giant mayflies, you can't unsee. Um, well, for that matter, once you and, see uh, a big drake being eaten, period. Much, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, period. Um, but the 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 tongue stone is an unbelievable drake pattern as well um, as well as just one of those kind of fishy fishy flies for sure for sure um can't wait for drakes can't wait for drakes uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves April, We're in April, man. Man. this, this is, one is one of those seasons, seasons to celebrate. celebrate i love blue wing olives i also love drakes i i don't want to i don't want to cause a scene but I, I do love drakes almost as much as blue wing olives probably more i don't know um, we have a question from Derek. It says, he says, what material for the wing case? Do you know that offhand? Uh, on which one? Tongue stone? Tongue teaser. Tongue teaser. That's the same body material, which I think is an SLF dub, um, with a single strand of flashaboo and an epoxy case. And Andy, uh, has a question. Any tips for tying up either of the last tungsten flies? Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I would say that understanding, um, there's a couple books out. John's got a book called Bar Flies. I'm sure you guys have it at the shop. Um, it's got great step-by-step -step on all this stuff. Um, John's one of those tires that doesn't have a YouTube channel. Again, being a little tech challenge, like I said. Um, that's one of the things I absolutely love about him. Uh, um, but uh with that, there's not a lot of ton of great tying tutorials about some of the flies that aren't a Copper John or a Bars or Merger. Um, I would search the internet, but but as far as tips go, um, especially in those smaller sizes, uh, finer diameter thread, um, and uh, and maybe tie those before you have a couple glasses of scotch. That's a good tip. I think that's a good tip for most any tie. Uh, all right, so let's do uh, fly number five without further ado. Yeah. yeah. Fly number five is, as you saw, the Slump Buster size four, and I chose uh, black as a, that's the color I chose because I'm a big fan of black. There's been uh, some recent live streams where we've been talking about stream fishing and olive has shown up as this pattern, this color you have to fish, and I don't frankly believe it. Black's the way to go. Slump Buster. Let's talk about the Slump Buster a little bit. I'm going to talk about the black version for a second because I think you bring up a good point. Um, right. Like just looking at a box, uh, some streamers here. One of the things that's the best part about streamer fishing, especially if we're going to be streamer fishing out of a boat early season like this is the visual aspect of streamer fishing. Olive is a significantly harder color to see in the water than something like, like black. black. And, and I want to watch stream. them crush the streamer, which is why black, black and white. white are two, are two of the, of the best, best colors, colors, colors you can choose. Yeah. Um, it was another great one. Um, again, kind of like we looked at that drop shot rig earlier. Um, I will usually put my big, uh, big visible one at the back and I'll put a smaller, maybe olive streamer up here. If I really feel like olives, th a thing. Um, 
But that way I've got a line of sight between my line, the streamer, and whatever kind of subtle fly is right here. So I don't miss anything visually. Sometimes if I'm watching the big dark one or white one or whatever, you'll see far too late the swirl and, um, um, and the and miss, miss right. uh, out of the clear eye versus getting to watch it all play out between you and your fly. Um, I agree. But yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you a hundred percent that, I mean, olive, I have no doubt that olive works. It just isn't for me as fun to fish as black or a color that you can see. I mean, obviously if you're going to fish like a deep sinking line, like fish, whatever is going to catch fish, but I want to see the, I want to see the eat. Call me crazy. Or if you're waiting, right? Um, you know, waiting, we tend to have that little bit more stealth factor to our to our approach and everything like that. And you know, I, I wish, wish I could, could see all my waiting streamer eats, but you don't. It's true. I also think that um, you know, there's the theory that you go dark fly, dark day, or dark day, dark fly, you know, light day, light fly. I think black is ubiquitous. I think it works in no, if, when in doubt, I always go to black. That's my personal opinion. But the black, I mean, I mean, that's enough talking about color specific stuff. Let's talk about the slump buster specifically. Let's, Obviously let's a talk good about trout fly, also a good warm water fly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things we're really lucky with here, and I'll, I'll touch on the the warm water side of things. Um, in the metro area, especially, you know, if we've got kids where we're having to be the educator, uh, the law, as well as a employee. Um, a whole day up on the Colorado may or may not be a reality, but we've got some incredible fishing close to home. Uh, these slump busters are, are one of John's um, proven patterns for some of his, his trophy bass fishing. Uh, we've got a lot of smallmouth that are coming into the shallows of some of these bigger reservoirs as that water temp is creeping up. If you guys haven't looked at the, the moon cycle, we're coming up on full here. I mean, you want to talk about a feel-good situation, um, put a couple of these in your hand and head down to a local reservoir uh, and go hunt some of those smallmouth. Uh, we do offer it. I've got it next to me, so I'll just show you a really great crayfish color. Um, but one of the things in particular about the slump busters um, in general, whether you're trout fishing or you're going to be bass fishing, is... Um, John, with this one, this was when, when again, like when I talk about John's flies, um, it's a different era than we exist in today. And, and they've caught so many fish. There's so much confidence baked into this and refinement that's put into the pattern. Um, but micro pine, you only could get rabbit zonker strips. So um, pine squirrel was not available readily. Uh, and this became more readily available on the market. John instantly saw how beautifully long the fibers were without uh, having as much weight to them. Um, so he palmered the collar, uh, enough flash to give the fly an element uh, that's going to attract a fish to it, but not deter a fish from, uh, from striking. Um, all of the slump busters feature a tungsten cone, which means this thing dives and raises uh, depending on if it's still water or if you're fishing it out of the boat or, or wading uh, in a river, you've got enough there to cut through that current uh, without having to fish kind of some of those more aggressive intermediate or, um, uh, or tungsten tips that are going to help get that fly down. Um, so you can kind of fish your regular leader on this fly and allow it to access the bottom and twitch it around. Um, one of John's favorite methods for fishing these slump busters is in tandem and fishing them actually upstream and letting them roll down through the rocks and then swing out at the end of, uh, at the, end of the, the drift and do it over again. So uh, a lot of ways to fish this, you could fish this as your weight fly off the bend, tie any one of your kind of more imitative nymphs that we've covered today, um, like this with a tungstone behind it, rolling around in some of those boulders would be a deadly, deadly combo Jim, too. Agreed. Um, opportunity Fishing asking if crayfish – color would work for carp um i mean certainly has the potential to work for carp front range carp probably wouldn't be the best option it'd just be a little bit oversized from my perspective what do you think russ uh there's the, those anglers have really, really been beating up those carp lately i see more carp on instagram than i see trout these days um 
So as those fish get a little bit more pressured, uh, I would probably say downsizing, but I do think the rust color is a phenomenal color for carp. Um, there's a number of reservoirs that are kind of uh, out in the flats that are still water. Um, or something like this would work really great where there's a little less visibility and you want a little larger profile um, to, mm -hmm. to move some water um, and something that's going to be heavy like this. Um, I mean, if you're looking to put a couple flies in your box that have a ton of crossover, slump buster is a really great option for carp, bass, trout, uh, all of the above. Cool. Uh, so that's five flies. Uh, good opportunity for anybody to join in. Uh, have any questions? For myself or Russ, we'll uh, leave a little bit of time opening uh, or time after talking about the flies to you know, talk with you guys. Um, and if there are any questions, appreciate you guys tuning in. But yeah, sound off in the comments. Let us know uh, what you guys are thinking. Just to go through the lag there while you guys are typing your questions, the five flies were the Copper John by John Barr, the Barr Merger by John Barr, the Tongue Stone. Uh, the um, tongue teaser and the slump buster we just spoke about. So all, all John Bar flies. There are way too many great John Bar flies to name in one small session like this. Um, Trouts is lucky enough to have a unbelievable selection of John's flies, as well as the rest of the Umqua selection uh, of signature patterns. So definitely uh, check them out online. Give them a call. They'll answer the phone and talk you through a little selection for wherever you're headed. But, um, but yeah, hopefully you guys have some questions. No, nothing comes through yet. So I think, uh, I think you answered all the questions in the beginning. Uh, I appreciate too. you coming by Russ. This has been, uh, I, I've enjoyed this. I don't know about you. Yeah. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. Yeah. yeah this is a good time. Uh, so this appreciate point we get some more, uh, some more of the internet chatter on here uh, as far as giving me a hard time for what I think. These are just thoughts, team. people. Uh, hopefully, uh, the coming episodes will be on the water. Um, maybe maybe Russ will be able to join us for one of those future episodes. But uh, for the time being, uh, we've moved uh, Five Flies to this live stream format. I uh, certainly appreciate Russ uh, stopping by. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email us in the shop. The links to all the flies are in the description. So if you want to load up for uh, the you know the month of April with some solid patterns, can't go wrong with John Bob patterns. We're actually getting a slew of questions coming in now. So just as I'm wrapping it up, we have a couple questions. So let's start off. Wasatch Micah says, for a tandem streamer rig, would you want the bigger fly in the front or vice versa? Vice okay or opposite? Vis a vis. Uh, I prefer uh, the larger fly to be in the rear of the rig. Um, I alluded to it earlier. A lot of that is if, if I have my large fly back here, I've got a smaller one here, and I'm the angler here, I can see everything that happens between me and the larger fly, which is far easier to track. Even that's from a fishability perspective, like how I make the fly dance. Do I kill it and let it sink a little bit more? I'm just more, more visually in tune with it. The other thing that a large fly at the very back does, um, I do it all the time. I feel like I'm in a good casting rhythm, uh, especially when you're fishing out of a drift boat. Um, and, uh, and you start to get a little greedy with the bank. Um, it's harder to judge your, your accuracy to the bank with the small, uh, small fly at the back and the big fly up front. Sometimes that small fly won't turn over and you can get a little bit more confidence, like you can get a little bit closer. And then finally that small fly turns over and you've got the grass tuft and then your rig blows up and almost hits your buddy rowing the boat and kind of throws off the mojo. Um, so I really prefer it for a number of reasons uh, in the back. Plus, right, um, let's just think about how basic nature works. Small doesn't chase big, big chases small. That's true. That is true. I also, I'll throw completely opposite colors, same size though. Like say a mm -hmm. black and purple Crelex. Like uh, a couple of weekends ago, I was throwing black and purple Crelix on the back and then a, you know, gold silver variation in the front. And, you know, they were chasing the gold and silver in the beginning before I put the black on, put the black on and they were eating the black. Um, so, you know, switching it up like that. I do know, like some people like throwing maybe like a leech behind a big streamer. So they might throw, 
the big streamer up front and then throw a small leech or a small nymph behind. Um, I'm not a huge fan of doing that, but I know that that is something that some people do. I know, like, let's say Kelly Gallup, he, I know he does, like, small nymphs off the back. I'm not hey, can, positive. Can different, different, uh, different for everybody, but, you know, I think going with what you feel confident is, is probably the best way to, to, to go forward, is my opinion. One of the other things, especially early season, where you don't want to have too much action to your flies because the fish are still a little bit cold. Um, so you do a lot more dead drifting and swinging of streamers and twitches versus full-on races back from the bank. Um, is putting on a little soft tackle behind a streamer. Uh, that's a that's a fun little way. It's kind of sneaky. You don't tell too many people. It's not like full-on meat, but it's still kind of meaty. For sure. I mean, soft tackle takes are some of the best of all time. Um, we have another question. Let's see. Uh, opportunity fishing are five flies ever a bundle package in the online store. Uh, we have done that in the past. Um, you know, things are a, a little bit more fluid than, uh, than they are normally. Uh, certainly something we're going to return to here uh, as things settle down and we have a little bit more time to build stuff online. Um, so that will be something coming forward opportunity fishing. Austin Shaw has a question about rigging. So uh, say you're using a 4X leader in Russ's rig, or I should say Russ's version of John's rig, using a tag technique, what tippet sizes would you typically roll with? Um, I would probably step up your leader a little bit to a, uh, personally, you're asking my opinion, I would step up your, your leader a little bit to a, uh, a 2 or a 3X, and that kind of depends on the rod weight you're throwing. Um, if you're going to throw a fairly large wind-resistant hopper um, that has some, some good floatability to it, um, throwing that on a 4-weight maybe doesn't sound like the most fun. Throwing that on a 5 or a 6-weight sounds great, especially as we're about to talk about hanging two heavy flies off the back of it. Um, so I would probably do a three, uh, like a short um, 3X leader, like a seven and a half foot. Umpwa does this leader that's called a power taper, which means you get a longer butt section, a really short transitional section, and then your level leader. And what that does is it forces turnover. Um, so you don't lose that energy, but it plows right through that short section, hits the fly, and it turns it over. And then I would go off of that 4X, um, uh, or 5x all the way down. Again, that's going to depend on the rod weight I'm going to fish. Um, you know, I think we. I, I I realize I'm lucky in the fact that I I have far too much fly tackle, um, and I can say I like to fish this kind of rig on this weight rod. Um, but really, we want to, as anglers, always consider the enjoyment that comes out of fly fishing. Um, when you're sitting there and you're trying to throw an inappropriate rig on too light of a rod, it can really take some of the fun out of just the the pursuit of our of our sport. So having the appropriate weight rod um, to move whatever kind of rig you're going to be moving, I always find to be a huge advantage. So um, you know, uh, it's kind of an ambiguous political answer to your question, but uh, the the reality is it it, it tapers. Um, you want to tapering down uh, lighter, um, uh, but the way that 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 tag allows it to move quite a bit, uh, so you get you get side to side movement as well as vertical movement when you're off the tag. You can get away with a slightly stiffer tippet because um, typically we go heavy to lighter, heavy to lighter uh, when it's an inline. Um, you can get away with a little heavier tippet because you do get good movement out of that upper fly being on the tag. I so I wouldn't worry about that if you're used to fishing like four and five or five and six. If you just fish straight five. Um, you'll be in you'll be in good shape. Cool. Um, let's see. Live on the water says David. So funny, David actually mentioned that we were considering that, but we uh, we aborted because we couldn't rely on it. Let's Something not do too, let's many not technology, technology, technology tricks at once. Tricks right. at once. I, this is a growing pain. So let's uh, maybe maybe in the future, David. And then Derek uh, asked, "Heavy fly on the point to aid turnover." I believe you. Yep. Said yes. Yep. Yep. yep about that when we did the coaching session on the whiteboard uh when 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 trouts and yvonne uh, archive this you'll be able to see i did a a whiteboard session with my best versions of hand-drawn flies uh, no uh, no judging 
But I do put that heavy fly on point to aid with that turnover. Same concept we just spoke about with the, the tandem streamer rig. Cool. Uh, so not seeing any more questions. Uh, obviously, if you have any more, feel free to live chat us. Go to troutsflyfishing.com. You can shoot us emails, shop at troutsflyfishing.com. You can call us. We're there 10 to 4, Monday through Saturday, until this all sort of settles uh, settles down or revs back up, whatever, however you want to say it. So I uh, certainly appreciate Russ, member of Team USA, director of marketing at uh, Umpqua. Thank you for joining us, Russell. Thank you, guys. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, Lee, I'll have a closing closing statement. Uh, you know, I, I really think uh, as anglers, we probably need fly fishing now more than ever. Um, and so opportunities to connect like this, kind of talk about the sport we love, um, connect with your local fly shop, trouts, uh, get in touch with those guys. Um, they can tailor make cool selections for you, um, kind of get you thinking about that later summer fishing if you don't have anything local or get you some of those bugs to go chase some of those tricky carp uh, down on the plat. But um, practice safe fly fishing. Um, and most importantly, wear a smile and have some fun out there. I, I also mentioned uh, Russell and the Umco team have been putting together some really cool uh, live streams, uh, typically in the evening with all their signature tires. And those have been a uh, uh, really nice sort of way to cap off a, a weird day at, inside of your house. So, yeah, I've been, I've been check, been all, check out that uh, on the internet. We're doing them on our Instagram channel, uh, at Umpqua Feather Merchants. Uh, typically, they're around 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. But if you want to hear from the horse's mouth the stories from uh, about some of these flies, the ways that they're built, um, I've had a lot of people tell me that it uh, it makes the flies seem inexpensive when they watch someone put it all together. Um, they're like, that's way more complex than I thought. Right. Um uh, so they're, they're a lot of fun. Tune in if you're ever interested in fly tying. Um, if this is the time to pick up a hobby, that's a great time to do it. The guys at Trouts have access to Umqua's entire catalog of tying tools, which would include Tiemco as well as Umqua tools. And that's the same for hooks. So definitely check out Trouts, keep in contact and, uh, we'll see you around. Yeah. See you on the other side. Stay safe. Appreciate everyone tuning in and uh, have a good April. Cheers.